Join me, Phil Stephanie and Russell Gerber on an interactive show designed to give you more insight and context to all things African. Good afternoon, everybody. How's that for a start for nocturnal animals? The ever impressive call of a male lion. And here, a little switch over to one of our smallest little primates and nocturnal primates, the bush baby. So today, folks, we will be talking about nocturnal animals. And of course, a big welcome to all of you out there. My name is Russell Gerber. Just on my own today. Phil will be with us again next week. But uh, once again, we'll be delving into this particular topic. And of course, I'll be taking your questions towards the end of the show and going through as much as I can. So, of course, what are nocturnals? And of course, these are animals that are active mostly at night. Now, that's not generally the rule. They can also be active sometimes during the day if required. But they focus most of their energy in being awake and active at night. This little shot here is, of course, a wonderful fiery-necked night jar. One of our most famous uh, night sounds, the call of the night jar, quite synonymous with the African bush. And of course, as the name suggests, a bird that is highly adapted for life in the dark. You can see the wonderfully big eyes and the reflection. You can see how much light that eye can actually pick up and of course helps to hunt at night. This is an insectivorous bird. They have a very wide gape, short little beak as you can see, and short little hairs on the side of their mouth. They're actually adapted feathers and they help to basically track those insects into the mouth and catch them on the wing. So just an incredible adaptation. And all of the species we'll be looking at today are highly adapted for life at night. Here we have a night heron. This is a juvenile. And yet another species that has taken its opportunity for developing its own niche in the nighttime. It helps to avoid competition during the day with the other diurnal animals. And of course, over time, the almost most common trait that you see with our nocturnal animals is the development of improved eyesight at night. And that is, of course, mainly down to the increased number of rod cells in the eyes. If you remember your high school biology, basically two types of cell in the eye, the rods and cones. Cones generally responsible for color and the rods responsible for picking up light. Now, all of these animals we're looking at have huge numbers of rod cells in the eyes, giving them that advantage over other species and allowing them to be active at night and actually, in many cases, prey on different species at night. In this little clip, yet another one of Africa's most iconic nocturnal animals, and this is of course a spotted eagle owl. Once again, you can see the incredibly big eyes. And the interesting thing for owls, of course, that many of you may know, that they actually have very narrow field of vision. They've got binocular vision, both those eyes on the front of the face. So that helps them to have a very good view in one small field, very clear view in the dark. When you sometimes see an owl moving its head from side to side and back and forth when it's looking at you or a particular prey species, it's actually trying to develop a 3D picture of that. that. That binocular vision can make it a little bit more difficult for them to see in 3D at night. And that's often why you see that little head bob. 
And here another one of Africa's most famous owls, and one of the most common we see on the cameras here is, of course, a Varro's giant eagle owl. And yet again, another big bird of prey that has adapted to life at night. And one of the other adaptations of owls is they actually have small, little, almost rough feathers along the edges of their wings. And that allows them to fly in almost silence as they go on the wing at night. And not only does that allow them to sneak up onto prey, but it also keeps it quiet around them so that they can hear prey the shape of the owl's face, and their excellent ear hearing. It almost acts like a, uh, a satellite dish, picking up sounds from around the face and actually funneling those audio waves into the ear sockets of the owl. So just another adaptation that we've seen in, in the case of the birds of how They've developed their own little niche at night, as I said, mostly to avoid competition. Now, another species that we hear a lot at night and don't get to see as much or as often is, of course, the whole group of amphibians. We hear frog calls pretty much throughout the summer. Various species from guttural toads to uh, painted reed frogs, all the way through to uh, bubbling casinas, and in this case here, of course, the foam nest tree frog or grey tree frog. You can see here there is a few different individuals all getting involved in the mating process, and you'll see they're all rubbing their legs together to create this bubble-like nest. And as they do that, the female will be laying a string of eggs. The males will be fertilizing those eggs. And once the process is over, they will actually then move on and leave the nest in its current location. As time goes on, it will start drying out. And will form a small protective cocoon over the small little tad ponds and eventually they will fall down into the pond below. So yet another amazing adaptation. This of course one of the most famous members of the reptile family and again another species that is more active at night. This is of course a very impressive African rock python. Once again, these can be active during the day and it is seen being active in the day, but because of their coloration um, and generally slow moving nature, it's safer for this big snake to move around in the dark. They do have natural predators, despite how powerful and ferocious they can be. I've actually seen leopard take down and kill python and eat it, even lion. I've seen that before as well, but it is a formidable enemy. Once again, an, an animal with an adaptation for great vision at night, but of course, the often overlooked advantage for snakes in particular is their incredible sense of smell in the nighttime. That flickering of the tongue, of course, picks up all sorts of information from the air and allows them to continue following prey species, even in the pitch dark, even if they can't actually see the chemical trails left behind by their prey species really really helpful for the snake to actually track them down unawares of the prey, spe prey species itself now the adaptation in the snakes of course is the pit vipers which have got specialized heat sensing to uh, pits on the forefront of their face That also acts as almost a sixth sense in picking up the chemical and heat trails of prey species. So yet another interesting adaptation and variable adaptations in terms of your nocturnal species. Everyone is trying to 
etch out their own little piece, giving them advantage over other species at night and those that, of course, are more active during the day. So it's interesting that, of course, we've spoken a bit about our prolific predators, and we'll come back to some more of them. But another reason animals are often active at night is, of course, to avoid predation. As I mentioned in the case of python, that can be vulnerable to predation as well. In this case, we have a group of catfish um, that we sometimes see on some of the cameras, especially as we get into the drier months in winter. You see these water holes start getting lower and lower, and the catfish will generally stay in the deepest parts of the water at that time, trying to avoid detection. But when it gets dark, it gives them the opportunity to move into the more shallow waters to allow themselves to feed. Again, without being on the menu for any potential predators that might be on the lookout and around during the day. More often overlooked nocturnal species and probably, not probably, by far the most dominant if it's of course the invertebrates. Oh. The majority of invertebrate species tend to be more active at night, but certainly our arachnids are the most enticing to people. This one is not actually an arachnid, often mistaken for one, known as a whip scorpion. But not something we capture every day on the cameras, and a very interesting looking animal, but it does actually prey on other insect species at night. Of course, the more common, more commonly seen arachnid species are, of course, spiders and scorpions. They, of course, tend to be the most worried about and, and are certainly far more active at night. Once again, for them, it's a combination of avoiding predation. There are a number of natural predators for the invertebrates during the day from mongoose to birds, uh, even to bigger mammals. But in the case of the spider, like this little clip that we have here, of course, it helps them to have their webs go undetected for flying insects. This is a lovely little video because we get to watch this creation of the web, which is always an unbelievably interesting thing to watch. But once again, an adaptation that allows the spider to complete its web without being preyed upon by potential predators and then set up its trap to capture any prey that it might be after at night. Um, they're far more likely to capture prey in the dark, hitting the web without seeing it and without any glare reflecting off the web. Again, something we don't often spend much time talking about. They tend to be quite small. and We don't often give much thought to these incredible little predators and incredible little nocturnal animals. But often one of the most feared species or groups of animals is, of course, the little spiders. One that is not so feared is, of course, the scrub hare. And by far the most common animals we see on the cameras at night tend to be the small mammals. Yes, of course, scrub hares are active almost solely at night. They'll spend the majority of the day hiding out, once again to avoid predators. But here we, get, we see a slightly different adaptation, unlike the other species we've looked at so far. Still the big eyes for picking up as much light as possible. But in this particular case, the most obvious adaptation is those huge ears developed for listening out for any possible predators that might be around. 
in this case this little field mouse another one that has actually got pretty good size ears in relative to its body even though not quite as big as the scrub air once again these little fellows can only be active at night to avoid predation the things that people often forget is that the heat of the African bush is very difficult to manage for smaller animals. Here, another one of the common visitors to our cameras, a large spotted genet. And this one thinking twice about eating the remains of what is a small platana frog. Just watch as he decides. No, I'm too hungry to leave this behind. So again, a species that is adapted for life in the nighttime. Smaller bodies can't handle and actually can't get rid of heat as quick as bigger bodied animals. And it's another reason why small mammals tend to be more active at night or in the cooler months. Here another shot of a beautiful African civet. So again, two of our mo more common species that we see coming down at nighttime, uh, certainly the, of the spotted variety. And one that we don't see so often, but certainly one of our most iconic nocturnal species is of course the porcupine. This little clip was taken only a few days ago. It's always nice to see them. They are quite territorial and you're likely to see them come around again in the next few nights, I'm sure. Now, what's interesting, of course, about the porcupine is its adaptation to avoid predation, despite being active at nighttime, is those incredible spines on their back. Um, they are a formidable weapon for any potential predator. But despite that amazing armor, they're also hesitant to be active during the day. Um, they can be susceptible to to predators who've specialized in hunting them. Things like leopard um, that do specialize in hunting porcupine, they have to be aware of. Another one of our most iconic nocturnal species is of course the African wildcat. Often mistaken for a domestic cat, they look very sim similar to the domestic cat and in many cases they are actually, their populations are being diluted the genetics are being diluted by interbreeding. But here you see the coloration of this little African wild cat. It's very similar in tawny color to a, its bigger cousin, the lion. Once again, just look at the focus. This little wild cat is focused on something in the long grass. The ears are per pricked up, eyes focused in one direction, no movement whatsoever staying as dead still as possible. And that is, of course, the only adaptation that you can, that you would need in terms of sneaking up on prey in the dark. Again, hoping that your armory of weapons, the improved eyesight, your incredible hearing, incredible sense of smell, the whiskers on the front of its face, all giving it a little bit of an advantage in terms of being able to make its way through the pitch black. You know, we've reminded you many times that the cameras, that when we watch these animals, there's no light on them whatsoever. We're picking up ambient light only. So in many cases, it's pretty much pitch black. Um, and we're seeing a adapted picture uh, and perhaps in similar sort of light to what this African wildcat would be seeing. Remember, again, they're picking up all that extra light for those extra rods in the eyes. And they also have a reflective layer on the back of the retina known as uh, tapetum lucida, which reflects more light onto the retina and allows them to see even better in the dark. And here, one of our lesser spotted mostly solitary mongoose. This is a white-tailed mongoose. It's actually our biggest mongoose species that we see. And again, just a reminder of the diverse 
animals we actually see on the cameras. Um, and this is just the small group of, of small mammals that, that we uh, get to see on most nights of the week. If you're lucky enough or brave enough to be up late at night on the cameras, these are often the kinds of sites you're likely to pick up. And then, of course, we have the big predators, the big mammals. I just love that sound. But I mean, what's different about the big mammals than all the other species we've spoken about so far? Well, as you can see, they're often not too fussed about keeping their presence hidden from other animals unless they're on the hunt, particularly a big male lion like this. They will often call out to signify their territorial dominance very much in opposition to this particular species. This is a brown hyena. They almost never make any kind of call. They try to keep as undercover as possible, slightly less powerful than the lions. But if you consider the brown hyena's close cousin, the spotted hyena, and the big male lion that we just saw, those two species are very vocal at night. You know, hyena, the hyena laugh is one of the bush's most iconic sounds, as well as, of course, that male lion roar. And this particular one, which we do get on the cameras from time to time, as I say, it tends to stay silent. A very shy visitor. And they focus mainly on scavenging. So as the, the less attention you can attract to yourself, the better when it comes to the brown hyena. Here you have the larger cousin that I was just talking about, the spotted hyena. And as we've touched on in the past, these species tend to spread out. The clan of hyenas will spread out over a given territory and home range, and they will look for any potential opportunity, whether it be a scavenging opportunity or indeed a hunting opportunity. And often that hoop that you hear sometimes at night from the hyena, that is a contact call to the rest of the clan to let everybody know where they are. And if they do come across something that's interesting, that's when you'll hear that hyena laugh or cackle that will attract the rest of the clan in. And that'll be, be basically the individual calling for backup to allow them to overcome any potential bigger predator that might be on a kill. Or indeed, if they are actually hunting themselves, that cackle will be for reinforcements to help them take down potential prey species. So we've touched on a few factors when it comes to the nocturnals. We've touched on the adaptations in terms of their senses, from the eyes to the hearing to smell. Uh, even touch in the case of whiskers and things like that. And then, of course, we've touched on the adaptation of size. You know, being a smaller mammal and the difficulty they have in regulating body temperature in the extreme heat or extreme cold, It helps for them to be more active at night as it's less likely for you to overheat if you're not being active in the, the sunniest and hottest part of the day. Another two nocturnal species that we're looking at here, we've just watched the short clip of the black-backed jackals 
And another one that we see on the cameras as well, less commonly, are side stripe jackals. The reason we wanted to point them out for you is that what's interesting about them is not only are they generally active at night, prolific scavengers as well, but they also tend to get or show a behavior for more activity around the early morning and early evening, which is, of known, which is known as crepuscular. Um, many of the animals we've looked at now are also active in the early morning and evenings, but these two in particular, two species of the jackal, you almost all, always hear them calling out to each other in a territorial fashion in the early evening. Um, as I said, intend to be more out and about in the crepuscular times. As you get into the late night, often they will retreat to their den and hang out there for the night. Again, with their slightly smaller body, if things start to get really cold, they would have to head back underground or uh, into a thicket to keep themselves warm. Much like the small mouse, the scrub hare, um, spring hare, all these animals tend to be more active in the early evening. And as you get into the still of night, things will slowly shift towards uh, uh, the late night visitors coming down to the water. In this case here, just a pretty interesting clip. Uh, I think we've shown you in the past of uh, interesting behavior for spotted hyena. They often stash kills in the water, and this is something you often wouldn't see during the day. Once again, under the cover of night, the hyena is much more bold, feeling much braver to go and fetch its kill that it's stored underwater, uh, unawares to any of the potential scavengers during the day. At night, it can sneak in, pick that kill up, and take it back to the den. Perhaps allow the young sub-adults to scavenge on that. And lastly, certainly the most iconic. Just had one on the cameras before we started. The ever-impressive leopard. You know, certainly one of the stars of the nocturnal stage. And seeing more and more action of the leopards on camera in recent times. Easily one of our most interesting nocturnal species and one you need to keep an eye out for. So I hope that's illuminated some of the interesting species and interesting behaviors that we see when it comes to the nocturnals that we get on AFRICAM. There are, of course, a plethora of species that we haven't covered today. So it's always worth keeping an eye on the cameras in the hope that we might just catch something that we've never seen before here on AFRICAM. But the silence and the ability to have this incredible vision into the bush at night with the amazing cameras we have on the ground gives us incredible insight into this secretive nocturnal world. And I, as I say, I hope this was illuminating for you. So just briefly, we've got a couple of questions. What kind of snake that was? It was an African rock python. And was it drinking or cooling off? It was actually likely looking for potential prey. As it was moving through the bush there, so it didn't look like it was drinking. And then the last question I have, will the larger spotted hyena prey on the smaller brown hyena? Uh, for the most part, they tend to steer clear of each other. Um, the smaller brown hyena is far more intimidated by the big spotted hyenas. So they'll generally stay out of each other's way, and the brown hyena will simply run away. Thank you, as always, for your questions, everybody. It's been wonderful being with you.
I'll leave you with this lovely lady taking a stroll at Olyphants River. Keep your eye on the cameras at night. You never know what special nocturnal visitors you might get. Thank you all. We'll see you all again next week.